the Joe Rogan experience. The thing I wanted to, to maybe discuss is is the balance that that needs to be talked about, and and, and we. This is where I would have taken the conversation from earlier about the media. What, how I, do you feel about Sweden, the, the way Sweden's handling it? Because we're talking yeah. about balance. Sweden has got a very different approach to it. Their approach is essentially, listen, old people, vulnerable people, please take care of yourself. Stay home. They'll provide assistance. They'll get you food. They'll do whatever right. they can be, they get to you. But people that are healthy, they want them to go out and live their lives. They don't want the restaurants to shut down, the pubs to shut down. This is a disease that, you know, it's ravaged people of all nationalities and all age and demographic groups, but their their idea is take care of your health, be careful, but let's get society back on its feet again. And they, they're widely yeah. criticized by that. I would love to hear what you think. Well, I, I think the jury's still out on whether that's a good strategy or not. Um, th- there's three different strategies, okay? And uh, there's a Harvard white paper that that delineates these pretty well. Um, I, I spoke with one of the professors from the Center of Ethics that, that was an author of this. And you can describe these three strategies in the following way. One they call freeze in place, which is basically what we're doing right now. It's what most countries are doing, uh, a hardcore quarantine. Uh, of course, that's different depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, the second, well, let me jump to the third one. The third one would just be surrender. Okay, let it happen. We'll deal with it as we go, but we're not keeping anybody at home. Uh, that's effectively what Sweden is doing. The second option would be sort of a mix of the two, which I think will end up being the American option, or it better well should be, uh, where we have a defined period where we remain in place, but then we, we confront the enemy. And uh, like I said, we're in a tactical retreat right now, but at a certain point, we actually have to come back out swinging and we need to be prepared to do it. Sweden took on the third approach, which is like, basically, they they think they can deal with it and we're going to see. Now, their cases are jumping up pretty dramatically. I don't know how much they'll continue jumping up. The Swedes are also very good at culturally following the rules. You know, like Americans don't like a lot of rules. The Swedes will 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 stop at a red light at two a.m. even though there's like nobody around. Okay, uh, same with people in Switzerland. Okay, this is this is we, we have deeper cultural differences. I think their social cohesion and their ability to follow rules, kind of like the Koreans, um, is is different than our culture, where we are we are just way more individualistic and we're going to do whatever the hell we want. If we want a flamethrower in our office, we're going to have a flamethrower in our office. And like, don't tell me I can't have it. Right? I mean. You can relate to that. I have a flamethrower um, right behind me. It's a good, solid <laughs> flamethrower. <laughs> like, I'm jealous. Like I, I don't have a flamethrower, but I have a lot of guns, and um, they're better. Know, guns are better. Having, yeah, it depends on the situation. No, they're like, o- they're always better, unless you want to start well, a fire. Well, that's what I mean. That's like, the only situation. The situation is, <laughs> sometimes the situation is you just want to start yeah, a fire, unless you're in the movie um, Alien. Yeah, uh, that, that is, you know. Each other. The, the the point is is you you need a diversity of weaponry. Yeah. That's 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 the truth. <laughs> right. Um, and so and so okay. So those are the three options. I think the jury's still out on what if it works for Sweden or not. I think it can work, and I would like to see us move to that rather quickly. Now we need to be careful about how we do it, but I'm very I'm very concerned about these indefinite um, extension of the timelines of stay in place. I think I think we have to start having reasonable conversations about the costs of that. And the costs are a lot more than just dollar signs. The costs are a hell of a lot more than just people's 401ks tanking. The costs are actually people's lives also, whether it's mental health or suicides or divorces or putting off all of these, um, all of these procedures that we're just putting a freeze on. So like, it, it, and it's, and I have a lot of problem with this. I mean, in places like Houston, our hospitals are not overwhelmed. They're like 50% capacity still because we're not, just not getting that many more cases. But why, why do you think that be... is? Why do you think Texas well, is l- less prone to this? Well, I guess I'll, I'll answer that question by stating why I think New York is the way it is and, and New Orleans is the way it is. Um, New York is the way it is because it's a, it's a giant city with enormous density. Uh, the, the most, it's the densest uh, uh, city in the country by far. It's also the most likely p- place that a lot of international travelers are coming in and out of. And so I think, there was, I think it's safe to say there was multiple hotspots that occurred within New York City, and then it spread wildly because people ride subways and elevators. I mean, it's not like Los Angeles. It's not like Houston, where we take a car everywhere. 
no matter what. There, there's natural social distancing that already occurs. Um, in, in New Orleans, well, they had Mardi Gras. I mean, yeah. they had Mardi Gras. They, they, you know, I mean, it's, there, there's explanations behind these things. And, and I do worry sometimes that our modeling is using these numbers in the wrong ways and not taking enough into the account into the fact that, that we just we have very different lifestyles in different parts of the country. And also take into account that we can target certain solutions. And so regarding the Harvard white paper that, that, that says the second solution is mobilize and transition, once you've slowed the spread by doing what we're doing, and again, I'm not against doing what we're doing. I just think we need to stick to the timelines and, and maybe make those timelines sooner than later and then come out and fight. And what does fighting mean? Well, while we're in weights, we're basically we're ramping up production of protective gear, we're ramping up production of ventilators. Again, our system is is amazing. Um, we are producing. We're going to be producing by I think next week or so, up to seven thousand new ventilators a week. We haven't run out of ventilators. I, I went through the numbers before when we we're talking about socialized medicine. Like one of the benefits of our system is we are actually way better prepared than people realize. Now we have a big lack of PPE. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I can go into it. one reason is that China was stopping export from 3M from going to China to re- the rest of the world back in January and February. All right, this, was, this just came out in, um, in, in an article that was written. It was confirmed by uh, you know, 3M and a lot of people in government. They were preventing the export because 3M produces a lot of it in China. And they were preventing those exports because they wanted to hoard the supplies. And then they act like the good guy and go around the world giving it out. I mean, China has to is we're, we're going to have to really look at the, our supply chains and our relationship with China after this. But that's one of the reasons we didn't have the proper amount of PPE. It also depends on the hospital. Again, like there is some accountability that has to take place with specific hospitals in specific cities and why they didn't prepare. I, I, what I've noticed as of late is this strange belief that the president is everybody's micromanaging boss. And that's just not how our system works, nor should it. And uh, there, there has to be some level of accountability at the local and state level, too. Again, I, I just got the phone with some of the doctors here at the Texas Medical Center, and I'm like, how are you guys on PPE? And they're like, we have so much PPE because we're used to disasters here. and We prepare. And so they're just not worried about it. Um, we've supl- set up the supply chains um, in, in advance. Like There has to be – we have to work together. I, there's What I've noticed in all the finger pointing, and, and a lot of it's just political opportunism. I don't yeah. know if you if – you, like if you – if you put these people up to a lie detector test, I wonder if they really think it would be the president's fault that this happened. Like, I don't, I don't think they could pass a lie detector test. You know, I think it's, I think it's a lot of political theatrics. But in any case, it's, it, it, it gets us away from the, the right way to look at our system, which is local and state government are our managers. They, they manage on those smaller levels. Like, if California wants to try a single payer healthcare system, let's see it work in California or a smaller state and then let's then let's scale it. Hell, let's let's see if it works in a city and then let's scale it. You know, mm. like you know, there's a reason federalism is the way it is. And it's hard to compare us to different countries in so many ways because th- these countries are like the size of our city. You know, like LA is bigger than most so many countries bigger around than the Australia. world. Like it's 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 a ma- the scale matters to a huge extent and um it's like socialism works if you've got maybe like 50 or 60 people because you can hold each other accountable there's a little bit easier maintenance as you scale it out you just can't right that's why co-ops exist in you know in this country and like bernie sanders lived on one you can make it work if you can literally see everybody all the time it's right. like a family a family unit is a socialist unit to yeah. each their own teach their need, teach their ability. When you scale things out, it dramatically changes things. And we have to remember that as it pertains to dealing with the pandemic and dealing with public policy as well. Um, the, the point I was making about the media a second ago, the, the, one of the problems, it's not just that they're not informing people correctly, which we discussed earlier. The other problem is that they're preventing us from having the right discussions. Because we do have to have this discussion that we're talking about right now, which is how do we, how do we responsibly move into a, a, a into a system where we're simultaneously combating the pandemic but also reopening our economy and we have to have that and and, and the natural reaction from disingenuous people is oh well how many lives is it worth to save a job and i'm like okay that's that's not the right question it, it's a very dishonest question 
And, you know, first of all, it assumes that somebody going back to work will actually cost a life. You can't prove that. I mean, if we're going to if we're going to play this dishonest game of counterfactuals, but also it, it, it misses the point. You know, we, we live in a world where we take risks and, and we have to take those risks and then mitigate those risks accordingly. And we can better mitigate risk when we better understand what we're dealing with and when we're better prepared. And those are the two things we have to do over the next month is get better prepared. And that's and the, the answer there is test more people, especially test people with antibodies so that we can see who's actually immune and we can give them like a, a certificate or something and they can do go do whatever they want. Um, getting more ICU beds where they might be needed, getting more ventilators, getting more PPE. So that's the preparedness side. And on the other side, we risk mitigate. It's just like, you know, like you explained in Sweden, let's keep sick and vulnerable people away. Let's target our, our efforts a little bit better. Let's take a more vertical approach as opposed to a horizontal approach. We, we can do this. We can do this if we give each other the grace and the space to do it instead of like this bad faith finger pointing of like, oh, you're just going to kill people and you don't even care. Well, it's like, that's, that's a terrible way to think about it. I mean, I, I, I could moralize this situation and say, well, I could, I, I'll save 30,000 lives this year because I'm not going to let anybody drive. And I am a better person than you because you have the blood of 30,000 people on your hands because you want people driving. That's a Me, great example. I'm the moral one. That is a great like, example. I'm the moral one. Yeah, and that's and I'm it worried like a about cheap that. Analogy, but it's not. It's not at all. No, you're you're absolutely right, and I'm worried about that when we do go back. I'm worried about that finger pointing. I really am because I think it's just going to muddy the waters, and I'm also worried about it being used as political opportunism. 